Dara is also one of the most uh, distinguished immigrants to the United States of America. He's a director on the board of New York Times. Uh, many, many uh, vast range of achievements. Uh, so let me uh, take this opportunity of welcoming this very distinguished audience here at this very iconic setting as well. So Dara, let me start over with, uh, how does it feel to be heading an organization and trying to turn around a culture of an organization which was plagued with data leaks, sexism, and what have you? I mean, what are you, how are you turning it around? Well, thank you for that very easy question to start. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, first of all, I did want to say it, it's a delight being here. This setting is is amazing. Uh, I've never had a, a sit down in this kind of a setting. And, and I did want to thank you for uh, being such a progressive and forward leaning thinking about how technology affects cities, about how technology affects mobility, and ultimately the role of technology in taking India forward. It's um, uh, it's a brave new world, it's an uncertain world, and to take on these issues head on uh, is something that's very important for all of us. So thank you for your being forward thinking and, and leaning in that way. Um, how does it feel to be CEO, CEO of this company? It feels great. Uh, you know, listen, I, I knew coming in that uh, this was a company that was creating mobility solutions that touch people every day. We uh, uh, we now offer 15 million trips a day on a global basis, so it's amazing how many people we touch on a daily basis. But I also knew that this was a company that had its challenges, and we certainly had our challenges with leaks and, and culture, et cetera. But the thing that we've always had is that this is a great service. Um, mobility as a service uh, uh, and transportation as a service that's available to everyone on a reliable basis everywhere is a service that I think everyone wants and all cities want on a global basis. Um, sure, there are challenges and there are changes that we have to make as a company, but I think it all starts with a product uh, and the team that we have on the ground and the product that we have is a strong product and I have great clay to work with and certainly the first five uh, months on the job have been an entertaining and interesting five months, but we've made progress, and I hope to continue making progress. So tell me, is this your first visit to India? This is my first visit to India, and it's great to be here. How come you were the CEO of Expedia and you never came down here? You know, I actually tried to get a visa, uh, and they wouldn't get me one. I have no idea why, but I think, I think you pulled some strings for us, so I finally got a visa and I got over here, so thank you for that. I mean, you're, you're far better than Travis. You landed up with a visa. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about that story. By the way, I checked around five times to make sure I had the visa and the date was, was right. So, okay. uh, so you know, I was wondering, um, you know, this name Khushro Shahi really amazed me. It's a very fascinating name. Uh, Khushro means king and Shahi means king. So it really means king of kings. In India, we say Shahanshah ka Shahanshah. Shahanshah. Yes. You know, uh, so you're one of the most uh, distinguished immigrants to the American society. Uh, what's your view on uh, Trump's immigration policy? Well, I think that um, the immigration uh, really made the United States uh, what it is now as a leading nation uh, at the globe. You know, we. Uh, the United States is an immigrant nation at its core, um, and and there are the self-selecting brave souls who who want to cross oceans in order to displace themselves after opportunity, after the American dream. And I always tell folks that the that, that the American dream is the greatest brand in the world. It's like Google and Apple and Uber times 100 that everybody in the world understands what the American dream means. It means if you come to America and you work hard and you respect the rule of law and you respect democracy, you can make it. And that American dream, I think, attracts the best and the brightest. And it's the best and the brightest who create the next generation of innovation, et cetera. I was incredibly lucky to get to America 
um, during a period when immigrants were welcome. Uh, and if you look at the S&P 500, the seals of the S&P 500, 50% um, of them either are immigrants or had parents that were immigrants. Um, if you look at Indians who are leaders in the U.S. tech field, Satya Nadella, Sundar at Google, you know, these are incredibly distinguished uh, uh, immigrants. So I thank you for putting me in, in similar company, but, you know, I think it's a short-sighted view. Uh, and it's a bit of a reactionary view that our president has taken. Um, I'm hoping that over time, the com the, our country returns to its roots, that is to welcome folks who want to come, uh, welcome folks who want to work hard, uh, and, and hopefully uh, have a population that n understands that if it, with education and hard work, they can succeed like anyone else uh, within the states. That's the core of the country. Uh, that's something that's very, very dear to me. I am incredibly lucky to have been a part of it, and I'll do everything I can for that to be the future of America. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so, um, Dada, tell me, I mean, what's, what's your vision for Uber in India? I mean, how do you see it, uh, say, 15 years hence in the Indian market? Well, I think that, um, first of all, I want it to be a heck of a lot bigger than it is today. Uh, we continue to invest very aggressively uh, in India, we consider the Indian market as part of our core. Uh, how we uh, perform as a company five to ten years from now is very much going to be determined by our success in India. But when I think about Uber and the transitions that we've made, um, we started as a car hailing company. Uh, and I think cars for us are step one. We're ultimately going to be about mobility, whether that's through cars or whether that's through bicycles or moto or auto, um, we're also going to move from just moving people around to actually moving anything around. Uh, you look at our one of the fastest growing parts of our business is a business called Eats, which is on food delivery, growing very, very quickly in India. So ultimately, we want to be part of the mobility solution of anyone getting anywhere, anything getting anywhere. And eventually, with autonomous technology, et cetera, I believe that we can be an alternative to car ownership itself. Um, cars are used 4% of the time. Uh, it's an asset that is extraordinarily wasteful if you think about asset utilization. Uh, and what I would like to see in India, you know, we have a big business in India, but our business in India is essentially a taxi hailing company. It's not about car sharing. And I think the next step for us uh, to get our business to where we want it to be in India is to move regulations forward so that we go from taxi hailing to true car share sharing. That will allow us to take, uh, you know, we talked about the traffic, traffic off the road. It will help with pollution, and it will make a much stronger use of the assets that we have on the ground here. So car sharing is a very, very important next step for us here. Uh, so the future is going to be sharing, connected, and zero emission? Zero emission, on demand, mm -hmm. available for everybody, everywhere. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so tell me, why does um, an Indian competitor like Ola beats you hands down in the Indian market? Well, I would uh, contest that. I don't think they're beating us hand down by any uh, means. Uh, listen, I think, I think it is great competition here. Ola is an excellent competitor. Uh, and I think ultimately the competition between us and Ola only makes our respective services better. When we look at rider sentiment, we look at driver sentiment, we look at the quality of service, we're actually leading in the marketplace, but you know it is a constant battle with Ola on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think where Ola is very effective is that they are hyper-local, and where we have the advantage is that we have engineers, we have the the smartest global engineers building marketplace so solutions, building dynamic pricing that reacts to supply on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And so we certainly have the global advantage in technology, but if we want to get to the next step in India, we have to become more local. We have to, I think we understand the Indian consumer, but we have to build our products so that it is tuned to the Indian consumer more effectively five years from now than we are today. That's a challenge. Wonderful. Uh, so both uh, you and both Uber and Ola have a soft bank connection. Yes, we do. Uh, 
and you sold off to DD in the Chinese market. Uh, five years hence, do you foresee that uh, you will you will merge with Ola? Uh, I think five years hence, we're still going to be in the Indian market. Uh, who knows whether it's through a merger, etc. Right now, I can tell you my focus is on investing in the Indian market, improving our product. And at this point, I'm not thinking mergers and acquisitions one way or the other. Okay. So you're going to go aggressively, you're going to go all out in the Indian market? Uh, aggressively and all out, absolutely. Okay. We're going to compete. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I read about one of the directors of global Uber saying that Uber should concentrate on core markets, USA, Europe, and leave markets like India, Japan, uh, to local companies, or even Singapore to grab. What's your view on that? Um, I humbly disagree. Okay. Uh, listen, we are a, if you look at the, the global portfolio and what differentiates Uber from any other car sharing company in the world is a breadth and depth, our global breadth and depth. We cover either through investment or operations 80% of the world's population. This is ultimately a scale game, and I think we can bring our solutions to everybody all over the world. And I think companies who just focus on their core markets are going to be guilty of not investing enough in the long term. If you look at the transportation space, listen, we're a big company. We are now through a run rate of over $40 billion in bookings on an annual basis, which is, which is a big number. But when you look at the transportation industry, the transportation industry is a $5 trillion marketplace. We're less than 1% of that industry. If we just focus on the core, we're never going to get to that $5 trillion number. So that, what that means is you have to be developing your core markets, but you have to be aggressively investing in developing markets and new technology uh, like EATS or auto autonomous driving or even air taxis, which is Uber Elevate, which is another project that, that we're going. You have to keep investing forward, not for tomorrow, but for five to ten years from now to be a great company. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dara, you talked about uh, flying cars. Uh, that sounds very fascinating. Uh, how close are we to that? Uh, we're closer than you think. Yeah. Uh, so the key here is actually battery technology. Um, the new generation of batteries is going to be dense enough and light enough uh, to be able to power rotors that are much smaller than the helicopter rotors that you see so that you can have vehicles that have four to eight rotors. Each of those rotors, because they're smaller, is going to be much smaller uh, is going to have much less noise pollution. They're going to be much quieter and will be safer as well. Uh, we are now actively working on the Uber Elevate project. I think that we will have vehicles that are flying in five years, and I think we will have commercialization 10 years from now uh, or sooner. So this is something that's happening right now, and we're having conversations with specific cities such as Dallas and L.A. in the United States to develop this product, uh, product and we're getting tons and tons of interest from cities all over the world. Uh, so that will tell me, I mean, what are the challenges, you know, because innovation is happening so fast. There's so much of disruption happening, and the regulators are always behind innovation. So what are the different challenges you find in cities across the world? I mean, you're operating in over 663 cities. What, what are the key challenges? Well, I think the, the key challenge is for us to build a product that scales on a global basis, because ultimately this is a scale game. Um, we, in order for us to compete with actual car ownership, we have to radically reduce the price of car, share, uh, car sharing and the, and the cost per mile. Um, and so as a result, you've got to build solutions that scale on a global basis uh, and scale over billions of transactions. The challenge is that we're not like other technology companies in that we don't work just in the technical, in, in, the, in the digital world. We actually, on a daily basis, are connecting to 3 million active drivers, driver partners who use our platform. Uh, we're doing 50 million trips a day. So we are actually at the intersection of the digital and the physical. And if you think about it, you know, you push a button and a car shows up. You push a button and your McDonald's order shows up as well. Um, we are actually digitizing the messy physical world. Um, but the messy physical world has rules and regulations that are different from city to city to city. And we have to respect those rules. 
So I think the challenge for us is to make sure that we're having the dialogue with the cities and the local regulators that, um, that creates a partnership because ultimately they do want our services in all these cities, but to, but to create these rules that are consistent on, on a state-by-state -state basis or on a national level so that we can achieve scale, we can reduce the price of mobility, and ultimately make our services available to as many people in the world as possible for as low price as possible while following kind of the local regulatory rules. It's a big challenge. It requires a significant investment in dialogue, but when you look at the size of the prize, it's ulti ultimately worth it. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, you have a lot of data uh, about the privacy of data and uh, who should own data. And I also wanted to ask you your view about uh, uh, data mining, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, and how they will disrupt society in the future. Well, um, the data issue is a really complex issue, especially to the extent that you're combining data with location, right? And, and that's a, it's a great responsibility to have um, personal data, and, and we want personal data about our users' habits so that we can serve them the most effectively. Do you want a black car or do you want an X? Do you like sharing with other users, et cetera? We want to make our service as easy as possible and as personal as possible. And so we are taking great pains now as we're maturing as a company to make sure that our data is absolutely safe to the extent that we're using the data to improve the service, um, using that data on an anonymized basis so that we're not improperly using that data one way or the other. And we absolutely are using artificial intelligence to comb through the data to understand what is the best way to match supply and demand, what's the best way so that when you push a button, you've got the lowest estimated time of arrival for a vehicle, how do we make as many vehicles show up in the right places where people are likely to ask for demand. This all requires incredible gigs of, of data and processing power um, and we just have to be responsible using it. So it's something that we take seriously, uh, and it's something ultimately that we have to do in dialogue and partnership with the governments where we operate in. Uh, tell me about, um, in a company like yours, I mean, how do you look at the future of artificial intelligence and um, how will it bring in greater disruption, blockchain, et cetera? Well, I think artificial intelligence, you know, the sexy artificial intelligence that people love talking about is, you know, robots who, who act in a human way, et cetera. Um, but the way that artificial intelligence now is playing out in the field as we speak are, um, are roles where you have very repetitive activity with massive, massive data sets coming together um, that are highly variable. Uh, so how should we price a trip between A and B most efficiently in order to reduce the price for the user, yet, get, yet increase utilization for the driver partner so that the driver partner is making as much money as possible and driving uh, as many hours as he or she is kind of in the car. Um, that requires massive scale of AI uh, and algorithms that are, are not dynamic in nature just can't figure out that problem on a daily basis and based on every location that we're in. So that's where we bring AI to bear. You know, blockchain, I think, is a, um, is, is a technology that uh, ultimately is going to affect uh, the payments industry going forward. Um, obviously, payments is a big part of our service, but we're much more focused at this point on AI and machine learning, making a service available in a much more efficient way to all of our consumers on a, on a global basis than blockchain. I'll leave blockchain to the payment companies. So uh, let me ask you one or two questions, and then I want to open it up to the floor here. Um, uh, you know, because gender parity is a big issue in India, and uh, uh, many of us believe that there has to be a conscious policy for gender parity. I want to ask you, why do you have such so few women drivers? You know, it's a great question, and I think that there are real cultural issues there, uh, and, and I think there are safety issues there, perceived safety issues. And actually, one of the greatest areas now of focus for us on the data side is to create a safer environment for drivers and riders. Um, you know, one is you think about before the ride to make sure that all background checks are done and we use kind of 
background data to make sure that the driver and the riders are safe. We use identity data, so you actually know who you're driving with versus you know, hailing a random person uh, on the street. And then also looking at the driver behavior to make sure that the driver isn't tired, to make sure that the driver isn't um, driving in, uh, in, in, in too aggressive a way. And then afterwards, using ratings quality to make sure that we've got the best drivers on the platform. I think that we need to um, talk to our driver partners more about how we can use our data to make our platform more and more safe. And we're very much hoping that we can attract more women to our platform. If you look in the United States, the fastest growing part of our driver base uh, are women. Um, and the, the great thing about our service is that you can essentially be your own boss when you use our service. I mean, these are, we've got 3 million micro entrepreneurs using our platforms to make money when they want, how they want, um, on a full-time basis, on a part-time basis, whatever choice they make. So I actually think that our platform is a terrific opportunity for a woman who has a family to come on our platform for three hours and use our service. In India right now, it's more difficult because of the nature of the regulations. You essentially have to work full time because these are licensed taxis. So again, going back to what we talked about earlier, the path to getting more women on our platform, I think, uh, starts with a path of true uh, car sharing so that someone can be on our platform not necessarily as a full-time commitment but on a part-time basis come on our platform for two hours come on our platform for three or four hours try it out and I think if you try it out uh, you like it and you'll engage with it more deeply that's the key to getting more women on our platform um, removing these regulations and really moving from taxi hailing which is where we are now to true car sharing uh, so, uh, you came into America as a very young Iranian. I was nine years old, yeah. Nine years. And your father went back and he was detained for six years. Uh, what, are, what are your memories about uh, Iran and how do, you, how do you view Iran right now? Well, I have very fond memories of Iran. I, I remember uh, the food and, and we, uh, um, my family all lived together in a great compound. So, you know, my memories of Iran are around family. Uh, and in Iran, family is more important than anything. And you know, here when I'm talking to to all of you, I'm I'm known as the CEO of Uber. Uh, when I go back to my family, I'm I'm the little brother of the family, and they and they make sure they they let me know that I'm the little brother. I'm not the I'm not the big brother there. Um, so I'd love to go back to Iran. I think Iran is an incredible culture. Uh, it's a very educated society. Um, women in Iran are actually go to school are quite educated and very powerful. It's a matriarchal uh, uh, society. I'll tell you, my mother is the boss of our family, uh, and so I, I think that um, Iran has enormous potential. I think it's going through some struggles as it as it relates to the role of religion in that society. Um, but I think that this is a country that has incredible ambition and incredible potential. It's yet to be realized and. If I could play a small part in it, uh, it's something that I would very much love. So wonderful. It's been wonderful interacting, and I, I, I just wanted to open it up to the floor. Uh, so anybody who wants to shoot a question, just raise your arm uh, and uh, introduce yourself and just shoot. Uh, just make it brief. No long statements. Brief, direct question. You'll never get this opportunity to grill Dara again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Diana, and I'm from uh, Ink42 Media. I have a few questions for Dara, and uh, just thanks. One, just ask one question. <laughs> okay, I'll try. So um, I have a few questions for Dara. First of all, um, welcome to India. And uh, um, well, uh, Ola, you're the com uh, the competitor has been early on to set up EV vehicles in India last year. Uh, so I want to know your views on why Uber is late in doing that. And also, um, considering the fact that you have already established Express Pool in San Francisco as some of your test trials or whatever, uh, what are your plans of bringing those in India? Thank you. So I think as it relates to EV, uh, we're very supportive of, the, of EV development. Uh, and we're looking forward to working with India to bring EVs to the road. Uh, we think the future... Of, of mobility in the cities is electric. We think it's shared. And ultimately, 
we do think it should be autonomous as well. It'll be safer, it'll be cheaper, it'll be better for the environment, it'll be better uh, for congestion as well. I think your second question was about, oh, about Express Pool. So Express Pool is a, the next generation of pool for us. Uh, we're now expanding it in the United States and we're absolutely looking at India as an expansion opportunity. We're, we're accelerating it. It's sooner than you think, but we haven't made any announcements. Okay, so uh, I'm yeah, I'm but just one question. One I want to give everybody an opportunity. So yeah. it is uh, I'm Anil Tikara from Delhi government. So do you have any plan for people move, mover like travel letters or escalators so that masks can be shifted from one place to another, maybe for one or two kilometers? Well, um, no specific plans for people movers, but we are looking at opening our platform uh, to different modes of transportation. So for example, in San Francisco, we're testing having electric bikes that are provided by another entity jump bikes onto our platforms. And ultimately, if they're different, any different mode of transport, if it's a car or a bike or uh, a moto or an auto or a bus, we will open up our platform so that you can go from point A to B uh, in a seamless way with one payment using our platform. So if that would include what you're talking about, perhaps. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, uh, people touted that uh, tra Travis's replacement might be a woman just to get the optics and the internal organization right. So, but... I think they got that one wrong. I'm sorry uh, to, to disappoint. I just wanted to know that I uh, think that you have uh, big shoes to fill just to get the organization right and everything right. Yeah, listen, it's uh, following Travis, I, I certainly have big shoes to fill. I think Travis is, is going to be regarded as one of the legendary entrepreneurs who created a great company of incredible value. Um, I'm deeply humbled by the board uh, choosing me to be his successor. Uh, and I absolutely know that I've got big shoes to fill. It's been five months for me. I think it's been a good five months but I know I've got a long road ahead of me. So the best I can do is my best, uh, and hopefully I can keep growing the company the way that Travis grew the company from day zero. Yep. Hi, I have a question here. So I'm half uh, Irani Zorashin. So All right. That's a good Salam alaikum. We have a we have in common here. And uh, I like what you spoke about uh, the real essence of Uber being how uh, it's not about providing the public transport that you're already doing, but more about ride sharing and how you can pool and create less pollution, better environments. So I would like to know your thoughts more around that and what are the plans uh, you have for India specifically? Well, I think for India, if you, uh, there are a couple of plans. One is to expand the type of product that we offer in India. So for example, I think the Moto product uh, the, uh, the motorcycle product is a very important product for younger people, especially people, let's say, going from a train station to work using a moto instead of a car. So we think moto being a part of kind of your everyday commute is a product that can be a very big product for us. We've introduced auto uh, as well as far as the product goes. Um, and so I think that we want to expand the type of mobility products, but we also want to expand what it is that we're moving. We started with moving people with eats, actually. Now we're moving food, and we're getting into the food delivery space. It's a very, very big and growing business for us on a global basis. It's one of the fastest growing parts of an India basis as well, uh, in, of our India business as well. So going from moving to people to moving food to perhaps moving anything is something that we're looking at. Um, then when you get into pool, and sharing rides reduces congestion and reduces costs, which should increase demand into the system, which then will allow us to lower the cost of our services as well. Autonomous is the next step. And autonomous, once we introduce autonomous as autonomy at scale, we will become a true alternative to actual car ownership. And that's, that's when I, I, I will be satisfied in Uber being a true change agent. I think that car ownership 10 years from now is going to be a thing of the past. No one here is going to want to own a car because if you own a car, you're only using it 4% of the time on average, which is a huge, huge waste of assets. 
you can you can be safer having a computer drive for you. You can be shared. You can be saving the environment, and you can have cities that are much less congested. And usually, you can give probably 15% of uh, the space of a city back to a city so that they can use it for whatever they want, just not parking. So I think it's a great future ahead, and certainly India is going to play a big part of that. Yeah. 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 Um, my name is Ram. I'm from Moody's Corporation. My question is, are you seeing any unique challenges from the regulatory standpoint in India that you don't see elsewhere, um, especially as you, uh, you, may, you may have to deal with state governments, which, again, the regulations are different in India. That's one thing. Second is, do you foresee anytime soon private cars being included for Uber? Uh, do you think Indian government would allow that? Well, I think that th you you hit the nail on the head. The, you know, our India business is, is a very successful business and one of the fastest growing parts of the overall portfolio. But the India business is, is essentially a taxi hailing, an electronic taxi hailing service. And when you look at our, our service in most other markets across the world, uh, and what has created really great value is when you get P2P car sharing. Uh, and I think that is a very important next step for the Indian market to develop so that you can have many more drivers on the road so that people can utilize their assets much more effectively and ultimately bring congestion down because there's no reason why drivers need to be full-time on our platform. Our platform is built for a combination of full-time and part-time. That needs to happen in order for P2P to grow here in India. Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Vinayak and I'm a lawyer. Uh, my question is, what in your experience is the most effective way to convince a regulator or a government to try a technology that doesn't exist? I think uh, it's a great question. Um, and, and listen, I'm getting started in this business, so I've only been in it for, for five months. But um, I think that with regulators, you can't just come in and have a you know, dialogue for an hour and expect results. Um, I think that as it relates to regulators, you have to understand what their problems are, and they have to understand that you're a partner who's going to be with them not just today when you need something, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. So for me, what it requires is deep investment and partnership and an exchange, and I think with that dialogue, you can get into a situation where you can ask a regulator to take a risk on kind of new technologies, and it also takes kind of forward thinking think tanks such as yours to create models for regulators going forward so that they're willing to take the risk. So it takes investment and sometimes it takes forward thinking and then once in a while it takes regulators to take risk. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. I would like to ask a question. Uh, we'll I'm from the media. We'll have, uh, we'll have uh, just the last two questions. Uh, we're running out of time. Just last two questions. While you say that India is the fastest growing market, we also know that Uber is uh, incurring a lot of losses. So when are you going to be on path of profitability? I mean, and I guess you, Uber is going to have an IPO next year. How ready are you for that? And um, when will Uber become profitable <laughs> for us to heave a sigh and say, yes, Uber is going to stay here? You know, you, are you a plant for my board of directors? Because they ask me that question all the time. Uh, so one of the advantages that we have uh, with Uber is that we have a portfolio of markets that we're operating in, and there are certain markets that are highly profitable, and those markets that are highly profitable allow us to invest in markets that are developing and growing faster and markets ultimately that have more potential. So I believe that India, for us, is a high potential market. Uh, so while the profitability profile of India is actually getting better, I believe that in order to drive growth for us as a company for the next five to 10 years, we should continue to be leading into India, and that means investing in this market in order to drive growth. We will get the profits elsewhere, and when I look at 2019 and our IPO plans, we continue to be right on track. 
I have a question. Uh, Tara here. Hi. Hi, Sindhu here from your story. Um, you spoke about how you're looking closely at the local markets and wanting to develop Uber for local markets. What could you possibly learn from your competition, especially in India? Oh, we uh, we learn from our competition all the time. Uh, so we have a uh, field team here who's very familiar with the market and and is consistently looking at competition uh, and and looking at how they operate against us. Now, that said. I believe that great technology companies um, shouldn't be competitor focused, but should actually be product focused and customer focused. So more than our competition, we want to be in touch with our driver partners. Tomorrow I'm doing a driver forum so that I actually talk to the folks that use our platforms. And believe me, they know more about our company than I know about our company. So it's those kinds of interactions with our driver partners and our riders which are going to shape our product going forward. Now, part of being more local for me means having local talent here building our product. So one of the very important initiatives that I'm putting in place as CEO is to increase the number of engineers that we have in India by three or four X this year and multiples above that next year. I believe we need more talent in India, engineering talent in India. The talent is there, they're smart, they're driven, they're entrepreneurial, and I want more of them building the Uber service of the next generation. Uh, so Dara, how, how long are you planning to be in India now? Uh, I'm of here days? tomorrow, and then I'm flying out tomorrow. I think it's a 4 a.m. flight. So no plans of watching a Bollywood movie? <laughs> Not this time, but I can watch a Bollywood movie anytime so on, on my Netflix account. Okay, great. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure talking to Dara. Uh, as you can all see, Uber is in great hands, uh, very, very safe, very visionary, uh, very steady hands, and I'm sure it will be a resounding success story. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this and my next visit here. Yeah. So let me thank all of you, and uh, please join me in uh, giving a big clap to Dara. Thank you. <laughs>